We are in week two of our series today, and we will be taking a look at chapter one of the book of Jonah. Um, Before we get started, though, this past week, Pastor Zach sent out a reading guide to help you follow with us as we journey, journey through this series. So hopefully you receive that. If not, it can be found on our website and on our Facebook page, and Kate is going to drop that link in for you joining us online right now. Now, as a leadership team, we recognize the impact that having the same scripture as a church body to read and study throughout the week was a vital part of our Summer of Soap series. It was a means of connecting us together outside of the Sunday morning experience, and it was a great way for us to be united with each other in that way. But it was also really helpful, a helpful tool for us to use to connect with God through his word. And that is something that we want to continue to do as we move forward. So the acronym has changed from SOAP to run. And throughout the entire book of Jonah, we will see that Jonah repeatedly has two choices. He can either choose to run toward God or he can run away from God. And because this is a story about us and for us, we wanted to be able to provide some tools to help you in the process as you read and study with us. So we also encourage you just to continue to journal Um, your thoughts as we read and study. So I have a question for you. Um, We all have that thing or those things that irritate us. You're sort of strolling through your day, you're in a fairly good mood, maybe a decent mood at best, but you're making some headway, and then that thing happens. And immediately it takes you down a different path, maybe to the dark side, right? It might better be described as a pet peeve. So if any of you feel led to share what your pet peeve or pet peeves may be, you can go ahead and feel free to shout it out. Gordon Lightfoot. Gordon Lightfoot. (laughs) Wonderful. (laughs) I hope we didn't send you to the dark side this morning. (laughs) All right, other than Gordon Lightfoot, anybody else? Clutter? Clutter. Well, I will tell you, I asked several people this question over the past couple of weeks. I did have to edit out several responses, which is awesome. Um, But of the ones that I can safely share, um, one person actually said, everything. Everything is a pet peeve. And I was like, great. (laughs) Okay. But others said things like slow drivers, being cut off, certain phrases were pet peeves like, it is what it is, or whatever, big egos, no sense of humor, nail biting, not sharing a dessert, and in a time of confession, mine would probably be people chewing loud. Those closest to me know that. And they kind of feel like they should eat in another room when they're with me. I am sorry. I am sorry. Now, it's fun to laugh at some of these pet peeves because at the very least, we can see how ridiculous someone else's is so that ours doesn't seem so bad, right? Just kidding. But we can laugh at them. But the truth is, our pet peeves can lead us down some interesting paths. Something annoying might turn into reaming someone out or worse. And we might find that we want to control what another person does when they are around us because of this pet peeve. I think we all have driving pet peeves. If someone cuts you off, it sort of sets the stage for the rest of the day. And every time you replay that moment in your mind, it ticks you off all over again. But what might happen if a pet peeve left unchecked becomes even more than that? What if it impacts who you are willing to be around and what you're willing to do? What you believe is right and true and just. Last week, we took a look at the first two verses in chapter one where we were introduced to Jonah. 
the peaceful one, son of faithfulness. And we sort of found that a little bit humorous last week, right? Because he is the least faithful and the least peaceful in the entire book. But God has called Jonah on a mission. God has been seeing the wickedness that is taking place in the city of Nineveh, and he's done with it. So he is commissioning Jonah, a prophet of God, to go and deliver a message to these people on his behalf. Now, Nineveh, again, is a very great city. It is a huge city. Historians talk about the size of its city walls being so wide that you could ride three chariots side by side by side across the top at the same time. It was a cultural hub, a military hub, and it was also wicked, one of the cruelest cities of the ancient world. Historians detail this, their own historical records detail this, and we addressed some of their brutal practices last week. And if you missed it and you're interested, you can find last week's message on our Facebook page. So God wants Jonah to go east to Nineveh, but instead he goes west to Tarshish. Tarshish was 1,500 miles away from Nineveh, and in a time where most everyone walked everywhere or rode a camel, I mean, that is a very, very long way. Jonah goes as far away as he possibly can from the destination that God is leading him to. There was no point further that he could have tried to go to. It was the very edge of the known world. Jonah runs. He is the only prophet noted who runs away from God. And as we talked about last week, he doesn't run because he's scared. He runs because he has personal bitterness against the people of Nineveh. And considering all we know of their brutal practices and techniques, I mean, it is understandable. But don't you think that God knew that? that God knew that Jonah really had a hard time with these people? Do you think that it's an accident that he chose Jonah to go? That maybe he thought that Jonah, in joining him in his mission to redeem and restore the people of Nineveh, might just have his own heart softened in the process. Sort of like the Grinch, have his heart grow three sizes in compassion, and grace, and in turn be healed of his hatred and bitterness. God is intent on his purposes, so it is no coincidence that he chose Jonah. But it's sort of like Jonah has his own vision for his prophetic career. And this mission, it's not part of it. He doesn't want his name attached to the restoration of the very people that his earlier prophecy, what we talked about last week, went against. I mean, how really would that make him look? So he rebels. And we might think that rebellion can look like a lot of different things, and that's true. But simply put, as a believer, rebellion really is just saying no to God. We tend to evaluate our walk with God in contrast to other people. Sort of like, comparatively speaking, I'm doing pretty good, considering I'm not doing this, this, and this. Or I am doing this, this, and this. So relatively speaking, I think I'm doing better than most people. And if God grades on a curve, which I'm pretty sure he does, I should be okay, right? It's not a big deal to say no to this one thing. But the truth is, you're really never more far from God as a believer than when you are close to him and say no. You might be like, "Um, that sounds like a really weird thing to say. Never more far than when you're close. I mean, what does that even mean? So there are a lot of godly people who are walking with God, let's say, in every other way. But there is this one area that they are saying no to him in. Maybe it's an action step that they know they need to take, or something that needs to be given up, a sacrifice of time or talents. Maybe it is a struggle that is often returned to. 
Every other part of their life is fine. But this one area they would prefer, God just didn't touch. It's not that his grace isn't sufficient in that area of life, because it a thousand percent is, a million percent is. But this might be an area that maybe they aren't even open to experiencing God's grace in. If it's a sacrifice of time, you might continue to find reasons to be busy. If it's a sacrifice of resources, you might continue to find something else that is needed more. And if it's a struggle, you might find creative ways to just sort of sneak it in under the radar. See, Jonah is a lot like that. What maybe began as a pet peeve, as an irritation toward the people of Nineveh, has turned into this one thing, ruled by a hardened heart and fueled by bitterness. And that is controlling his belief of what he thinks that they should experience, which is restoration with God. As if that's his choice to make on their behalf. And if it's his driving force to avoid what God is asking him to do at all cost, at all cost, even his own life, digging his heels in with a resounding no. See, we might think that that one thing that we are holding on to isn't impacting our decisions, our lives. But Jonah is an example given to us that that simply is not the case. So let's take a look at verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Down to Joppa. That reference is important, and we are going to get to that in just a second. But the thing is, if you want to run from God, there will always be a ship at the ready. If you are looking for a way out, you can always find one. The world is full of opportunities to do that. But can you really run from God? Psalm 139, penned by King David, addresses this very thing. And we're just going to take a look at verses 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. So Jonah, he boards the ship. The ship sets out. And then we read in verse 4, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. So in Hebrew, the words break up are translated as ponders breaking up. I mean, how does a ship ponder? It's as if the ship is alive. It's an interesting thought because the thing is, you can run from God. You just can't outrun God. Because when you get to the place that you are running to, God is already there at work, drawing you back to him. Jonah is just as important to God as the Ninevites are, and he wants to redeem and restore them both in different ways, for different purposes, but he is intent on reaching them both. So this huge storm begins to rage, and we read in verse 5, All the sailors were afraid, and each tried or each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So all of the sailors are on the deck of the ship, and they are terrified. And they are praying to any and all gods that they can to see what's going to stick, what is going to calm the storm. This is a time period where people worshipped many gods. 
and they are throwing stuff into the sea to lighten their load. You can imagine them crying out, tossing things overboard, saying whatever they can think of, hoping that they hit the bullseye. And the storm will stop. But it's not working. So where is Jonah in all of this? The end of verse 5 tells us this. But Jonah had gone down into the lower part of the boat and was fast asleep. Oh, Jonah, right? I mean, here these pagan sailors are up on the deck of the ship doing what they know to do based on their way of believing to rectify the situation. And here is the prophet of God with the message from God, and he's asleep. Jonah is a literary masterpiece written in Hebrew. And in our translations, we miss some of the creativity of that because our wording doesn't always equate exactly the same. But there is a play on words that repeats in this chapter, and this sort of thing happens throughout the entire book. So the word down, for example. He is going down to Joppa down into the ship, down into sleep. This word is repeated to help us see how in Jonah's attempt to run from God, he is actually descending deeper and deeper into himself and further and further from God, each decision taking him down, down, down. Now, in reference to Jonah being asleep, the Hebrew meaning for that kind of sleep is a deep sleep. He wasn't just dozing. It's the same Hebrew word used when God put Adam to sleep, when he created Eve, a sleep that resulted in the removal of a rib, so a very deep sleep. The pagans, in the meantime, they're wide awake, praying in the only way they know how, while Jonah is sawing logs. Checked out. So what happens next? Let's take a look at verse 6. The captain went to him, and he starts to fire questions at him. He's like, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. But what they don't know is that Jonah's God already notices them. And he is busy at work. And that is why things are happening the way that they are. The, also, the author is also showing us that Jonah sinking further and further into himself is making him completely unaware of what his disobedience is doing. Not only in his own life, because there's this major storm at work overhead attempting to get his attention, but he is also completely unaware of what that disobedience is doing to the very people around him. The sailors who are currently trying to keep the ship, the very ship that he is on, afloat. It's important for us to acknowledge that our disobedience does not affect just ourselves. Because when we live in disobedience, we aren't fully ourselves. We aren't living the life that God has for us. Something is off, and that impacts other people. C.S. Lewis has a great analogy of this in his book, The Great Divorce. It talks about when people are running from God, that they begin to get more and more hollow, to the point that they become see-through. But when someone comes back to God, they begin to take on texture and color. And what he's trying to show is that when someone is walking with God, they become so much more alive. They become that full version of themselves that he sees them as. Jonah's decisions are not just his decisions. What began as a personal conversation, a personal invite from God to Jonah, eventually wreaks havoc on everyone around him. 
but he's so checked out that he is unaware that he himself is this force of ruin impacting those he encounters. Verse 7. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So casting lots is equivalent to like an ancient rolling of the dice. It was a way to find out the will of the gods. It was sort of like our version of drawing straws, but it had really big consequences, things, you know, like death. So it's probably why to this day we say things like, you know, don't draw the short straw. So they do this. They cast lots, and surprise, surprise, right? It's Jonah. Jonah is the one drawn, and he has to give account as to why this raging storm has come upon them. So verses 8 through 9. So they ask him, tell us who is responsible for making all of this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? Verse 9, he answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now, some versions of verse 9 have the word fear in place of the word worship. I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. And in Hebrew, the meaning of that word fear translates to a deep respect of someone. You have a healthy fear of them because you respect who they are and maybe what they're asking you to do. Sort of ironic, don't you think, that that is the way that Jonah would describe his relationship with God. Now, can you imagine what the sailors are thinking about him at this point? I'm sorry, you worship who? What on earth did you do to make this happen? So you're running from your God who controls the sea. And your big bright idea was to board a ship? Our ship, nonetheless. They can immediately see how crazy what Jonah is saying is. But Jonah, I mean, he's sort of pompous. Because in his description of who he is, it is not evident at all in his actions. I mean, it might sound great, but to the sailors, it's like mumbo-jumbo. Sort of like... Please spare us your religious credentials, Jonah, and call upon the God you say you worship and fix this. So at this point, as the reader, right, we are also thinking, really, Jonah, are you seriously going to act like that? I mean, you know what you've done. You can see the harm you've caused, and you know you have the answer. You can do more than spout out words that sound great, but have no actions behind them. But then it's sort of like, oh, wait, (laughs) that's that big guy stuff we talked about last week? Hold up. Do I do that? Have I done that? Have I said I'm a follower of Jesus, but my actions reflect something different. It's important to pause here and step out of our thoughts of Jonah and just really look at our own lives. We are supposed to see how ridiculous and over-the-top Jonah is here so that we might be able to recognize a similar trait in ourselves. And the details of what those things might be are between you and Jesus between me and Jesus. But they are important to take note of so that we can begin to work through why that might be and what we can do different going forward. So ultimately, what does Jonah do? In verse 12, Jonah tells the sailors to throw him overboard to stop the storm. But the sailors, they don't want to do that because they don't want his death 
on their hands. So instead, they give everything that they have and they try to row back to dry land. The sailors feared God enough, respected God enough to try and save Jonah's life. But had he even considered theirs when he boarded the ship? But the more they row, the more intense the sea gets. And the sailors can see that they are not going to outmatch God. They're not going to outrow God. So they call out to him and they ask him to spare their lives. To not hold against them what they are about to do. And they pick Jonah up, they toss him into the sea, and immediately the sea calms. You kind of wonder if Jonah was thinking, oh, is it too late <laughs> to get back on? But see, Jonah had two choices. The first was to die, right? To be thrown overboard. I mean, Jonah would have had no way of thinking what was going to happen next. And his estimation of he's being thrown overboard, that's it. So the sailors' lives are spared. But an interesting thought in doing that, he still would not have had to go to Nineveh. As morbid as it is to think, he would be running even further from his mission. The second would have been to repent and cry out to God himself. This also would have ended the storm, sparing the sailors' lives, but this, this would mean that he would have to give up what he wants and be obedient to what God is asking him to do. And we can see what choice Jonah has made. On the surface, no water pun intended, however, I think it's a pretty great analogy. On the surface, Jonah's choice seems noble. It seems sacrificial. But as we watch him throughout the rest of the story, his decision to go overboard might just be way deeper than that. More of that sinking down, down, down. What is remarkable about God is that our disobedience will not stop him from fulfilling his purpose. However, our disobedience will cause us to miss out on being part of his purpose and the blessings and the maturity and the personal growth that that obedience can create in our lives. Something happens in the lives of the sailors. They fear God enough to want to spare Jonah, and they witness firsthand how the seas immediately calm. Imagine what Jonah could have talked with them about in that moment had he chosen to turn toward God rather than run further away. But he misses it because he's literally sinking down. Our obedience will be instrumental in us being engaged with the mission of God. It will translate and flow out of everything we do, everywhere we go, because of God's grace and mercy and our willingness to accept his grace and mercy. He will be able to do through us things that only he can do. The greatest way that we can love those around us is by investing in our personal walk with Jesus. This does not mean that we will do everything right or have all of the answers, but it does mean that we are in tune with God and he can fill in all of the places that we lack. Sort of like the oxygen mask on an airplane. There's a reason we're asked to put ours on first, because we're no use to those around us if we're passed out, checked out, out of focus. We are way more effective in the lives of others when we are intent on growing in our relationship with God. We won't ever be perfect at this. That is why God offers grace upon grace but a heart following after God in the midst of all of the craziness is a heart that can not only be in tune with God, but also be blessed 
by him. God is a loving father, and his heart is for us. He is passionate about us, and he continues to fight for us every step of the way. Verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. See, Jonah might have thought that he was finished, but God was not finished with Jonah. And he continues his mission to redeem and restore him to the very end. First, this crazy storm, now this massive fish. Now, I think any of us, including Jonah, upon seeing this sea creature swimming our way, would have assumed that that was leading us toward an immediate death. But only God can do this. He transforms this vessel of death into a vessel of grace to bring Jonah life once again, a second chance. Because from the point that Jonah is swallowed up by this fish, he is enveloped in the grace of God. And what does he do with that? We shall see. Jonah might have dug his heels in, right? With this resounding no, determined to avoid what God is asking of him. But God is running one step ahead. I mean, just think about that for a second. I mean, we really don't know what God looks like, but I just envision like long flowing hair and a white robe and Birkenstocks, but a face of beauty. And you just envision him running, like running ahead. His grace and his mercy is a tremendous gift of love. He is protective, he is loving, and he is steadfast to reach his beloved son, Jonah. And he's doing the same for us. May we be intent as we go through our days on giving God that one thing so that we too can live fully alive for him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. I thank you for how creative you are, that you would use a storm, that you would use a fish, that you do not tire of us and think, huh, oh, whatever. You want to sink down? Go ahead. You are always one step ahead. I thank you that every day we are never, ever out of your sight. And Lord, we thank you for the story of Jonah. We thank you how it reveals to us that your grace is ever-present but our obedience and our willingness to follow after you is pretty important too. We thank you for this time and we thank you for your love. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen.